Hi, everybody. This is Erica Mello, and welcome to episode number 102 of Tough to Treat. And uh, Susan and I want to thank everybody who's left us a testimonial on wherever you listen to, to podcasts, you know, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube. There's so many. And we truly want to thank you from the bottom of our hearts for, for, for leaving us a testimonial. And if you have not done so, and if you found value with uh, what we talk about, please leave us one. We would appreciate it. Uh, I'm flying sola today. So when Susan and I get together for our next episode, we will pull some winners for our webinar giveaway that we, uh, we re recently recorded. So we will do that on the next episode. And in this episode, I talk about three patients of mine. And the, the thrust of this is on treatment progressions, not on finding drivers, not on finding the cause. Uh, Susan and I will unpack that separately, we each sep separate patient on different episodes. But this is about, I found the driver, this is their problem, how I treated them, what positions I treated them in, because it's very important, and how I progressed them. Because it's not just about giving them exercises, it's about thoughtfully giving them exercises. And Erica, for example, Erica, how did you, why did you treat this patient in this position when she has this issue? And you need to be able to answer that. And it's about using your clinical reasoning skills, using your expertise and explaining to the patient why you're doing what you're doing. So I hope you enjoy it. And uh, if you have any questions, you uh, know how to reach me. Hey everybody, this is Erica Mello and welcome to episode number 102 of Tough to Treat. And as I mentioned in the intro, I'm going to be discussing a few patients of mine, uh, multi-treatment progression. Um, Susan and I can unpack the assessment at a later date on, on an another, another episode. So patient number one is a female who came to see me with complaints of bilateral foot and calf pain. One side wasn't worse than the other. It was basically just gripping in the calves, gripping in the feet and pain. Worse with, with long, long walks and lying at, in supine positioning at the end of the day when she went to bed. Um, she had a, an habitual gait pattern uh, from when she was younger where she really walked very far forward, almost like with her weight on her toes. And so when I assessed her, the most glaring thing I saw was that her center of mass was so far forward. And I mean, an obvious, with a little bit of an anterior tilt, such a significant anterior translation of her thorax. And, you know, no surprise, right? Anybody who has that, their position, the position so far forward on their toes or on the balls of their feet, their posterior toe is going to fire like crazy, right? Just to prevent them from, from falling over. So in my uh, assessment, I determined that her driver was in her thorax or her primary driver, as we say. And, you know, are we thinking posterior compartment syndrome? Yes, probably. That's her, we want to call impairment or, or pain generator. Uh, but her driver was certainly not in, in her lower quarter or her primary issue was not. Um, it was how she was positioning herself. And it made sense with her story. Um, also just a lot, you know, a lot of people have, have high anxiety. And uh, sometimes when we see patients who are, have more of their weight on their sort of their heels, they're more of like a bit of a slouch, the posterior translation of the thorax position, it's, I associate it in Chinese medicine talks about this with like a more of a depressed slouch posture, right? Um, and with more of like a forward, sort of forward lean onto the forefoot, you're at, you know, you have this um, sort of fight or flight type of, of, of positioning. And that comes from, from, from some from Chinese medicine. And uh, she definitely had that sort of fight or flight position. So, once again, I'm not going to go into the assessment. We're going to talk about that at a later date. But her primary driver definitely resides in her thorax with a significant anterior translation of her thorax. And so when I went in to, uh, I put my hands in, in her on her rib cage and uh, gave her just some 
gentle decompression. She has certainly a lot of shifts and twists in her body, which we all do, right? And once again, it's our job to figure out if it's relevant. I gave her a little decompression and gave her some novel input into her trunk, into the thorax. And all of a sudden, you could feel her weight going back, like centering. And, you know, I don't like to spend a ton of time on the posture unless the person has problems standing. But you need, so walking obviously emanates from standing. And her, and her issue is so obvious in terms of being so far forward. I felt I had to address that in standing first. So when I modified her thoracic position, she went just literally, literally centered and she's like, oh, I feel so different and feel better. And then I let go and she almost fell over forward. And, and I think that you get like the buy-in or that we talk about like the wow on our podcast. And she was like, oh my gosh, you know, no one really looked at that before. So, and that just drives me crazy, <laughs> you know, but that's another, that's another story in another podcast. So in terms of positioning, for treatment. Would I get her prone a lot? Probably not. That's going to encourage a little bit more of an interior translation of the thorax, which is what I'm trying to avoid. All right. So with her, you want to cue something more, you know, let, 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 let your chest, let your chest drop, let your sternum drop, right. Versus more of this sort of, you think about, she had a significant anterior tilt in the lumbar spine as well. And her team, almost like thrusting the chest out. Do you want to give her cues, you know, to, let the chest drop, soften the chest. You know, it's going to be different for everybody, but I think for somebody like her, you want to really get her out of that habitual movement pattern first. So we talk about, you know, what's the impairment or, you know, is it an overactive system? It's definitely an overactive system on her. I don't necessarily think that she has any significant strength holes, but it was definitely an overactive posterior chain for sure. I'm pretty convinced. Uh, so in terms of treatment position, I actually got her supine quite a bit. And it's because you want to encourage the brain map and you want to encourage that sort of forced positioning from the ground. So the brain gets used to that tactile input of the thorax on the, on, on the table, so to speak. Because if I get her prone or, you know, even in, in a standing position or sitting to start with, she's going to sort of go into that, that anterior translation of the thorax into that anterior pelvic tilt, which is what I don't want to do. Even in prone, uh, if I did in prone, I'd probably put a ton of pillows under there, but I actually have not treated her in prone. So I, uh, in, in a supine position, I have, I do a lot of, uh, you know, release of, of some of the muscles in, in, you know, in, in the front of her chest, just, just for more novel input. So I'll put my hands, you know, up on her, up on her upper ribs and I'll have her just do some breathing, uh, with her arms. So I have her arms straight up in the air and I'll have her just do some, you know, overhead shoulder flexion. I'll have her, uh, take a TheraBand around her forearms. We're in the supine position and she's doing you know, elbow lifts right up to the ceiling. She's doing overhead flexion with the band. Anything that's gonna encourage and open up the front of her chest and get her, her brain used to the input from the ground. And that is really how I started treating her. It was really mostly supine. So the brain gets a sense of the feeling of the surface or of, of, of the thorax on the table, on the mat, on the plinth. I got her on a, I had her in a prone position, hugging a ball. So she was not really prone flat. She was prone over a Swiss ball to encourage more of that posterior thoracic translation, right? And, and, and I did some release of some of the erectors in her, in her upper, upper thorax, prone on the Swiss ball, once again, what are you trying to do? What are you trying to achieve? You're not going to willy nilly get her in prone, get her in extension. That's going to be the wrong thing to do, right? So it's very important from a clinical reasoning standpoint. What is the impairment? What are you trying to achieve? And all of your treatment positions and exercises should be geared towards that, that particular goal. So if you don't have access to like a Swiss ball, for example, you can actually get her um, in a, you know, seated on your stool 
uh, and put her arms on me in a cross position face. So you're facing your treatment table and she's on, on the stool and she's almost like resting her head on her hands. And you're gonna encourage that, that little bit of a posterior translation. You can do some release work there. I did get her in sitting, but I had her doing, um, I was doing some uh, work in the, in, in the thorax and release work. And I had her just doing some slump sit, slump sit, to once again, train the brain, to getting that, uh, getting her out of that interior translation. Cause that's what was driving, I believe a lot, a lot of her symptoms. So I do have access to uh, Pilates equipment. And, and if you do, uh, I think a great way to start somebody like her is like, I did some roll downs on the, on the, the Cadillac, uh, just basically some roll downs. Once again, soften the chest, let, let the chest drop to encourage that. I actually had her go supine on the reformer. Once again, getting that feedback and that, that, that tactile input of the, of the carriage of the carriage bed on her thorax, having her hugging a ball, right? Hugging a ball, almost like let's hug a beach ball, try to hug somebody to get that, that, to retrain that, that, that new movement pattern. Uh, you can actually just all just have her hold a magic circle as well. Anything just to sort of get her out of that anterior translation. And then you can do um, some of the footwork on the reformer, which, which, which I actually have been doing. And so anything in it, anything supine to, to really start with and, and getting her to, to, to use the arms as an input sheet. You don't have access to that. You can get her on a leg press, a flat leg press. Same thing. It's just, you know, same movement pattern, right? You can you can have her just hold something to get her to get her that, that feedback on on the, the 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 leg press surface. So that that's something that that I've I've been doing, and I also have had um, you know I do eventually need to get her going uh, upright. Uh, I actually just tested her walking uh, backwards and it was not pretty. <laughs> so that's something that we need to focus on a little bit, but that's not my prime goal right now. That actually was way too hard for her. Um, I mean, she can do it, but it, it's not like, uh, it, it's not, it's a poorly controlled basically. So that's, so I'm really starting her off in, in, in the supine position. What you could also do uh, is uh, you can actually have her, uh, is continue to lie supine on uh, if they don't have any equipment at home, which I actually don't think she does. You know, you can have her, which I'm having her do lie, just basically supine positioning and just putting a yellow TheraBand around her forearms and doing, you know, elbow lifts, overhead flexion and things like that, as I mentioned. So I think that is, is, is very, very good because um, that'll help decompress the thorax and it'll also encourage some of that, that, that feedback. So uh, if I were to progress, I'm progressing her, I may want to take the feet out of it to start. So I would next move her into a kneeling position. So probably holding, a, hugging a ball or with a magic circle or TheraBand in front of her and just have her go uh, do like a little bit of an AP shift in kneeling. Okay, just sort of once again, train that, just take the feet out of the picture. That's how I would start to progress her and then maybe start to move her a little bit into some closed chain on, on the reformer or have her go into closed chain um, on all fours and get a little, do it sort of a little bit of a posterior translation of the thorax there and start to do um, things with her legs, right, to simulate some gait. I'm not there yet with her because I'm, you know, I'm the new, just started, started seeing her, but she's improving and uh, I wanted to, to start off with this clinical pearl because it's, it's very important that we choose our exercises with care and we have to have a good reason why we're doing them. My next patient is a woman who had uh, significant shoulder pain with Primarily uh, putting her hand behind her back, you know, to, to go up and sort of scratch her mid back and at end range flexion. But her main issue primarily was, uh, and initially was, you know, I can't get my hand behind my back, Eric, or, you know, it's pretty sore. So uh, 
once again, Susan and I can unpack this. We have not done a podcast on, on any of these patients I'm talking about right now. So we will unpack these at, at greater, greater length uh, on a later episode. Her driver, her primary driver was her upper C spine. And it, it, she didn't have a lot of issues in her shoulder in terms of, um, you know, objective findings. She, it definitely was her pain generator for sure. I mean, that's where the, the symptoms were. But her driver was is her upper neck. She had a lot of neck issues, neck issues in her history. So once again, think about your patient's past movement history, past injuries. Those were once again high on a priority list to assess. And I knew she had issues in her neck. She told me. So with her, the main issue was an overactive superficial system of her, of, of mostly of her, of her posterior, posterior chain in her neck, right? So did she have weak, deep neck flexors? Did she have, you know, weak multifidi in her neck? Not really. It was just an overactivity. So that's the impairment, right? It's an overactivity. So every time she put her hand behind her back, she would hike up her scapula, her, her, you, you would see the overactive levator, overactive cervical multifidus. You could see it. So, and once again, I'll, the assessment will be in a later episode, but in terms of treatment for her, okay, so yes, her hand behind the back was her meaningful movement, her, that was her, her main complaint movement-wise. Her driver was in her upper C-spine, like her COC1, it wasn't like C6-7, it was up in her neck, she had a lot of tone there. Um, so when I went in and similar to the first patient I discussed, I went and I just modified her movement. I, 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 I ended up doing some little decompression on, in, you know, in, in inhibiting, basically, for those of you who do some of the visceral work, I inhibited uh, some of the, uh, the levator and some of the other superficial muscles. And her hand behind the back was almost normal. And, but obviously that's temporary. <laughs> and I was explaining that to her. It's temporary, you need to train. So from a treatment perspective, which is what these clinical pearls are, are directed uh, directed towards. I did a lot of release and I don't do a ton of release in the neck and prone. I do it mostly in supine, okay? And I'll do it in also a sitting position with, um, with their hands um, on the, like they'll be sitting in my stool and they'll, they're gonna have their hands crossed like the first patient and they're gonna just rest their head on, you know, on a pillow. But I did a lot in supine. So I did a lot with her in supine with arm movements. That's a dynamic release. So I had her do, you know, you know, uh, like a reverse fly as, as far out that as she could go um, before before symptoms set set in. I had her close to the it's her left arm. I had her close to the edge of the table on the left side. I was up in her neck, okay, working and doing things in her neck, releasing. Uh, I'm not going to say mobilizing because I don't necessarily think she had. Um, any kind of joint stiffness. I do a lot of muscle energy up there. But while I was doing that, I had her moving her arm. So her left arm was off the table. I had her going into shoulder extension, breaking down the movements of the hand behind the back, right? I had her literally uh, having her, uh, getting her back centered on the table, had her do some internal rotation. That, of course, that was limited, right? While I was working on her neck. So I did a lot of, of, of treatment of her driver while I was moving her, while she was moving her arm, okay? Bearing in mind that the impairment that I wanted to correct was an overactive superficial system. I then had her go into a seated position on the plinth, excuse me, on, the, on my stool and had her cross her arms and rest her head on, the, um, on, on a pillow. And I was standing behind her. And once again, I just had my hands up in her neck and I had her just do some internal external rotation in that position. Okay, yes, that's a tough position for the neck because it is trying to hold her head up. So I, that was more of an advanced position, but I, I tried, I helped her, I was trying to control it. And so that helped quite a bit. So the supine is very easy because that gives great feedback for the, for the brain and the nervous system in terms of just letting the, the muscles go, okay? In terms of, 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 yes, it's safe to lie down, so to speak. And once I got her up on the plinth, in the, you know, off the plinth in the seated position with the arms on the pillow, 
that that definitely was a harder position and i and that's something that i would not give to anybody right out of the box a home program that was more of a position that i could get the most bang for my buck in in terms of of the lease the next thing i had her do was go onto the wall so she faced the wall like she was going to do a wall squat both her hands were in probably a normal base of support on the wall i had her keep her hands there and then i had her walk to the like she so her hands on the wall she was walking to the left so her feet were moving but her upper trunk wasn't so she was in this sort of right translation of the thorax she's pretty pain-free there and then i had her go back to center then i had her move her lower quarter to the right and that was engaging some muscles that were prohibiting her from going into that shoulder extension internal rotation position i had her in that position stay in that position where i was engaging the barrier so to speak and I ended up doing a lot of release in the neck there as well. In that position, her shoulder did get a little bit, she, it felt quite compressed to me. So I ended up doing some release work in the shoulder in that position, primarily posterior cuff and lats. But it was the work, the most of the quote unquote release work was done in the neck, in supine, in sitting, hands on the plinth, and in that position on the wall where it engaged the barrier. Then I had to repeat the movement again, hands on the wall, walking to the right. Her feet were going to the right. So that's this relative sort of tensioning of her left shoulder, because that was her left shoulder was bothering her. And it, she would get better every time we did that. I mean, re reminding myself that it's an overactive superficial system. This is what I need to do. Then I, I got her on her hands and knees. This is, this is over a course of several treatment sessions, OK? Um, but I'm it's sort of abbreviating it for you guys. Um, had her hands uh, on her hands, hands and knees, and bearing in mind she had like an end of range shoulder flexion deficit too. So I wanted to uh, to see if her neck, if there was any significant issues with her neck in a in a prone to, in hands and knees. Excuse me, so that's kind of hard for the neck if you have a lot of you know deficits in the posterior chain there. And I actually have an issue with that myself. So that is not an easy position for me to do. But she did not. She was okay with that. So what I had, had her do. I had her go in a very narrow, narrow base of support. Okay, so she had her hands very close to her, and her hip and her and her her knees, uh, her legs were sort of normal hip hips width apart. That was extremely difficult for her. So you think about when you go into. I'm sorry, this was very easy for her. Excuse me. So when she went into a very narrow base, it was easy. It wasn't engaging any significant barriers, right? When you go into a narrow base of support. If you have a significant deficit in like i would say your shoulders your thorax a little bit your neck that's going to be much worse for her it was better because her deficit really wasn't her shoulder it was really more of of of, of her neck it was in her neck okay and bearing in mind that that can be difficult for, for neck patients it's something that you have to assess it was fine for her i had her move her hands out a little further a little further to a very wide base and that's obviously was harder because that's what we found on the wall right when 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 that when her left shoulder was being tensioned when she was out in more of this um i almost want to say um what's the word i'm trying to think of almost like this shoulder extension hand behind the back position when she had her hands wide like that that engaged the barrier so i started her off in hands and knees with hands very narrow to start with because I knew she had this end of uh, end of range shoulder flexion deficit as well. Then I had her move her hands wide, and then I started to engage some barriers with regards to her upper, her left glenohumeral joint, and up, and uh, her and her upper C spine. That's when it started. She started to feel that the tensioning and and, um, and 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 like almost like the restriction there. And so I gave her some cues for her neck. Uh, you know, imagine your your neck is long. Imagine you've got. Um, a hook in between your like sort of like a guy wire like or a hook cue in between your vertebrae that's making you long it's lengthening you and that did help her so just once again remember the i'm trying to get her in a position to get her hand behind her back better not every shoulder patient needs cuff strengthening not every shoulder patient needs interior deltoid strengthening although that is a big strength hole she did not i then had i had her on the cadillac and you can do this with a TheraBand behind her back as well. But I had her in a kneeling position with the um, with the bar behind her, so she was in shoulder extension. 
okay? And then what I had her do is she was facing away from the bar. And then I had her do some, almost like some um, kneeling slump positions that would really get her into shoulder extension, right? So I did a lot of that with cueing up her neck, imagining her, her neck being long. So that's what I started her off with. Those are the past, you know, I would say first few sessions. And then I ended up doing um, some work on the Cadillac, doing, um, you know, basically putting her hand, lying supine on the Cadillac and just having her push her hands straight up, almost like doing a, 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 a bench press with her hands very wide because that was her deficit. Just remember what's the deficit, what's the impairment. And she, that, that was the issue with her. Whenever her hands were wide, whenever she had any kind of extension in her shoulder, internal rotation, that really bothered her, her, her quite a bit. I also did do some release work in her neck in the supine position when she was pushing up with the bar, okay? So as your patient gets to higher load activities, you may need to do some dynamic work or dynamic release in those positions versus just lying on their back doing nothing, <laughs> you know, or just or more passive, right? So I think a, as the patient gets better and as they start to progress their program, you're going to want to get them in positions that engage. The more, you're going to get them in obviously harder exercise progressions and they will engage different barriers that you have not addressed in your initial sessions because you haven't had them do the exercises yet. So with her, I was very mindful of her neck. Bearing in mind, though, is she didn't have a strength deficit there. So it was really just putting her in positions that didn't cause the, those muscles to become overactive. Hands and knees was challenging a bit at first, although I said it was easier for her. It may be challenging for other patients. So that would be hard for a neck, but neck driver, so to speak. But that was okay for her. So uh, she actually is doing well. <laughs> and uh, uh, doing pretty okay with this. And so once again, I wanted to give her as an example because she was more of the overactive, superficial, still posterior chain, ironically, but in a very, very different way than my first patient. This patient was much more of a, I wanted to show you that just because she has a deficit in her hand behind her back and it is a shoulder problem, her driver wasn't there. Her exercise progression certainly did not focus on the shoulder exercises per se. This last patient uh, came to see me as a, a male in his early 30s with bilateral upper extremity and bilateral lower extremity pain. Uh, I actually have a bunch of people with bilateral issues. It's uh, crazy, but he had bilateral hand pain and bilateral uh, leg pain below the knee. So he was, uh, cycling was a major uh, issue for him in terms of symptom, uh, uh, symptom progression. So, I mean, sitting was, was tough, uh, but it was really worse on the bike. And so he was a road bike. So one of the clinical pearls, and I think if you've listened to other episodes of the podcast, you look at center of mass and standing, right? Normal, narrow, wide. But with somebody on a bike, you need to get them, especially with a positioning on the road bike, their hands are very narrow, okay? And like with my past, my prior patient with the shoulder problem, she was okay narrow on her hands and knees and okay narrow on the wall. Her shoulder wasn't her driver, right? He was not okay. So I had him, so to make a long story short, once again, we'll do a podcast on him. Uh, you think about the bike, right? It's very hard for someone who has a shoulder or a thoracic dysfunction. It doesn't have to be painful, but it, it, you, you may have a non-painful dysfunction there and it's affecting your hands. Uh, it affected more of his hands than his, uh, his legs on, on the bike and he's clipped in, right? Uh, so it'd be a much more of a narrower stance. And so you need to assess the patient in a narrow stance. If someone came in to see me, you know, uh, who had, you know, unilateral and they still were on the bike and the bike made them worse, I would do the same thing. Just so happens his was bilateral. Um, it, you know, what's the pain generator? Is it a facet? Is it neural tension? Is it coming from the cervical spine? Is it coming from the thoracic spine? 
I, you know, it, through my assessment, I determined that his thorax was his primary driver and he had a lot of vectors we call muscles or components. He had definitely a dural component, a, a neural system component to his, to his problem, right? So was his, ultimately it's the nervous system, right? At the end of the day, but it, with him, it was how he was positioning on the bike, right? So I had him on the wall and I had him go wide and he looked pretty good. Of course, he's going to look great. A lot of people look good with the exception of my last patient, right? So he was, uh, he looked okay. And I took a lot of pictures uh, as well. And then I had him go sort of normal-ish. And then you would see these sort of typical shifts and twists in his spine that you see with a lot of people, you know? And once again, you know, it's our job to determine if this is relevant. There are a lot of people who get on a bike and you have a lot of shifts and twists and, and they're fine, they're fine. So we need to use our clinical reasoning skills, our expertise, because we are experts at movement, to determine if this is relevant to his symptom presentation. And given my clinical experience, because I see a lot of patients who cycle, I mean, I'm in New York, people do cycle here a lot more um, because it's faster <laughs> for sure than taking our subway. But they're generally, uh, they look different in the normal narrow wide position on the wall. I had him do a little mini push up as well. You can have him do that if you're not finding anything in, the, in those positions on the wall. So his primary driver once again was his thorax with a long sort of neural dural vector. He had, it was his, I, I do think that his, his pain generator was, was something within, within the thorax. Um, within, uh, in, in, you know, I don't know exactly if it was coming from some form of visceral issue, or it, it, I think he had something dural and it was, it was just, he was just positioning himself on the wall to sort of offload one, one part of his body that was trying to be lengthened. Because when you're on the bike, you're, you're really lengthened on your, on the, on the, uh, on, on the, on the bike, right? So you, you think about the slump position, he's really in that position. So I think what he was doing is brain was probably saying, well, I don't really like this position. I'm going to just shift you here and I'm going to shift you here. And that's very common, but the clinical pearl I wanted to point out in this particular case is that uh, you need, if someone says to you, if they have, you know, neck pain on a bike or knee pain on a bike or foot pain on a bike, you need to assess them on the wall, okay? Because they are, will look different. I, I, I won't say everybody will look different, but in my clinical experience, people will adjust their, how they respond to gravity and the neural input from the wall by, by just, they're, they're gonna, it's human nature, they're gonna adjust their posture, right? Uh, so with him, once again, primary driver was in the thorax with a long neural vector. So I, so what, how do you treat somebody like this, right? Think about the movement pattern that's required to get on the bike. He needs to go almost butt to floor squat, right? You need full hip flexion, full knee flexion, full dorsiflexion. He can't compensate at the foot because he's clipped in. You need, you need to look at butt to floor squat, which I did. And uh, determined once again in that particular position, he was going way to the floor, way to the floor. At the bottom of the squat, he shifted his entire body to the right. Relevant because he needed that range of motion to get on the bike. His brain is gonna say, well, I'm not gonna fall over to the right, I'm gonna center myself. So I, that's how I, and once again, we'll talk about this in a later podcast, but with him, the squat was a mainstay of the program because I need, he needed to get there. For example, he also had a problem on a plane. A tall, very tall person, right? Similar, you need full, you need a lot of hip flexion if you're tall, right? You're in those small, small, small seats. So, with him, I actually started him in terms of like release work or positioning. I actually did start him in the seated position on the plane because I did a lot of sort of slumps and sitting and slumps and sitting upright to see if I could find anything that was jumping out that was, I don't even wanna say optimal, that was poorly controlled. So was he actually had, you know, in terms of impairments, did he have an overactive system? Eh, not, not really. Um, I don't think so. I think he had a couple of, of muscles like serratus and uh, an overactive right external oblique that, 
you know, I did release in the sitting position and in the squat position that that possibly could have been contributory. But I believe that his issue was this long dura, long neural vector, okay, or muscle or tension, whatever you want to call it. So I did a lot of release in those positions. I mean, this guy not, was not disky. He was not symptomatic at all in the, in, in, from, a, from a neural tension perspective, right? Uh, his slump test, quote unquote, was negative, right? So I had him do in standing, uh, for all those who are asking, like I had him do a median nerve test in standing. I had him do a straight leg raise with a bow, B-O-W, in standing as well. And those were asymptomatic. And, and, and I, so I did that way at the beginning in my assessment. So with him in terms of positioning, once again, think about positioning, what does this guy need to do? He needs to squat, he needs to get on a bike, he needs to use his arms in a narrow base of support. And so I started him off with slumps. I did a lot of work there, release work. And then I had him do some, uh, I had him take a yellow TheraBand and wrap it around his forearm. And he did, he did some slumps with the yellow band uh, and gate, sort of almost restoring some neuromuscular balance. I think his impairment was a loss of control and some just neural tension. That was his impairment. So did I need to do a ton of release? Well, not, not really, a little bit, but, but it was really more training and motor control. But I did my hands-on. I did a lot of hands-on. What I think a lot of people miss is that when we're having patients train new movement patterns, we need to have our hands on them or we need to watch them not just sort of, you know, click a check off a box, right? We need, we need to see and we need to feel. And uh, we need to really make the person, what's the word I'm looking for? The patient needs to feel felt. And so for somebody like him, this doesn't need a ton of release. It was really more training and getting him to engage the barrier in that lengthened position, like a slump, full sit slump with leg extension, et cetera, dorsiflexion. I did a lot of work in there. I had him go into a yellow band right, go into a squat shy of the, of his, uh, of his movement to the right. So we did, we basically trained a lot in that particular movement pattern. And I had him also go on the table and do some um, yellow TheraBand that I mentioned in the prior, prior, prior patients, uh, you know, elbow lifts and overhead flexion just to keep, uh, once again, the nervous system, it's easy position to start with, with patients who have issues in their upper extremity because it's unloaded and the bed gives them a reference for center. It's very important, especially with the cyclist. I had a patient a while ago, we did a podcast on him. He um, was a podcast of a guy with chest pain. He literally, when he cycled, he trained center. He would ride that white line and he would not deviate. So they are like very, very cognizant of center. So I actually had him starting to do squats I put like something on the wall and I told him to, you know, I gave him some cues. I like the balloons in the armpits for those of you who've listened to our podcast. Um, I actually had him put some orange Franklin balls underneath his, underneath his armpits. That usually helps, but that did not with him. So I took that away because I think he was just gripping. And so he was doing a lot of squats with the yellow TheraBand to restore that neuromuscular balance and go right to the floor. And it's, all, it's, it's basically neural gliding, right? You're, you're gliding the nervous system with, with squats. I also had him go on all fours. Same thing, you're just doing mirror images, right? Yellow band with the slumps, yellow band with the squat, going on all fours, rocking back, doing some, um, I had him do, uh, I had a yellow TheraBand wrapped around his forearms in the all fours position as well. These are just mirror images of the, of the, uh, of, of the same movement. And so once again, you're training the brain, you're trying to give the patient a different movement pattern. So with him, bilateral upper extremity, bilateral lower extremity, was the impairment, was it overactive, was it underactive? You know, he had a lot, I believe, like, once again, not like neural tension in the sense that we know it like pins and needles, I'm reproducing my back pain. It was really more of, of, it was from a clinical reasoning standpoint, every time he lengthened his system with a squat, with a straight leg raise, with a bow, in a sitting with a, you know, lit flexion, he definitely, um, he, he said he felt off. No other symptoms. And I think that's important because how do you, you know, what do you see, what do you do when you see somebody like this, right? So the treatment progression has to be clinically reasoned through. So if I were to, I'm going to get him on the Pilates at some point, 
I'm going to have him do the roll downs. Once again, mimicking that, right? And having him do some cueing in, in, in his thorax. Once again, balloons in the armpits, things like that. Um, and so that's where I'm at. Um, these three patients were all quite different. I hope that you enjoyed it. Um, and Susan and I will be back with another podcast, um, another episode, excuse me, um, in, uh, in a couple of weeks. All right. Thanks, guys. If you have any questions, uh, you know where to reach me. Bye.